When we remember the Second World War, people tend to remember things like the Normandy invasion and the Battle of Britain, and we, those are the heroes that we learn about in our history classes. But the men of Force 136, they, they were part of a secret war, and they never received the same kind of attention as other soldiers did, but they were equally as brave. And in fact, what they were up against was even more frightening because they were going to be on their own, and it was life or death for them. Because these soldiers did what they did, we have a better country, literally. That's a long-term legacy that happened because of what they did. The crucial thing to understand about Chinese Canadian history, and especially the Chinese in Vancouver, is that right from the beginning of Vancouver, there were Chinese here already. The Chinese helped build a railroad that ended up in Vancouver. And so there was a Chinatown before the city of Vancouver was in fact incorporated. One of the interesting things about the history of British Columbia is that it, is, it was built on white supremacy. A lot of people don't like that term now because it sounds like, oh my gosh, Canadians were Nazis. They weren't Nazis, they were white supremacists. They, they, you know, at the time, people said things like white Canada forever. They would say this is a white man's province. Uh, the premier Richard McBride in the early 20th century, that's what he said, it's a white man's province. You know, there was a Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s in Vancouver, and one of the targets for them was Chinese. And if you grew up here and you're a Chinese Canadian, you probably knew that there are certain places that you, you should kind of be careful or avoid. Well, when I was growing up in Vancouver, we were confined only most of the time in Chinatown. As far as uh, the Chinese were concerned, it was quite peaceful. But when the uh, white boys came in, it was quite different. Those days, the kids were brought up to tease them. Tease the Chinese people like this. They call you names and throw sticks and stones at you. And we hear a lot of uh, kids coming around and they're singing the chinky chinky Chinaman sin, you know, and they always tease you. There wasn't any swimming pool for the Chinese to go swimming. You're not allowed to, go, to eat that much spot. Chinese Canadians were not considered full citizens. They did not have the right to vote. And because they didn't have the right to vote, it also meant that they couldn't practice certain key professions like law and, and medicine and engineering. And so they worked generally in laundromats or tailoring shops, restaurants, greengrocers, sawmills, things like that, very, very limited opportunities. In 1923, the final kind of the most challenging piece of legislation was brought in for Chinese, which was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which essentially banned all future uh, immigration from China. So in, in many ways, the, the community was cut off at that time. You know, the kind of exclusion in terms of immigration and the exclusion from the best parts of the city, it had been in place for decades. And so this was a segregated city. Um, it's a, a hidden history, but it's a deliberately hidden history. It's one which they themselves, the Chinese uh, Canadians, especially those who were born here, grew up here, went to school here, they were trying to overturn um, this history of segregation and uh, exclusion. In 1939, the Second World War breaks out. And there were great debates going on in Chinatown about whether or not the men should serve. There were arguments. Because of the nature of exclusion, there weren't many women and weren't many families. And so this younger generation of Canadian born and Canadian raised uh, children, they were precious. They were an investment almost. So to older uh, generations, to risk those very valuable young you know, men and women in a war, fighting for a country that was treating them as second-class citizens. It didn't make sense. And yet there was another group that believed, well, if we do serve, we have a better chance that we're actually going to be able to, to fight in, for the vote. We're going to show our loyalty to this country. 
And so in the end, it was actually that group, the second group, that, that won the day. But then when they tried to enlist, they were basically told, we don't really need you, you're Chinese, we're not really looking for Chinese, and shown the back door. Late 1941, Japan enters the war, so they attack Pearl Harbor. And within eight hours, they also invade Hong Kong, which was a British colony at that time. And very quickly, the Japan uh, took a, a bit of the playbook of the Germans, and they basically blitzed all through Southeast Asia. Well, one country after another was falling, and they were going into Burma, and the Americans and the British couldn't hold them, couldn't contain them, right? So they decided they needed help. The British had an experience in Europe already of trying to help the French resistance. So they thought, Perhaps the Chinese Canadians or the Chinese in Canada could be helpful to us. We could train them up and then send them in, parachute them in behind Japanese lines to help with local resistance movements. They demanded, actually demanded in writing, that they would, that they would allow us to enlist. So all of a sudden they called us up, right? Chinese only. We were all Chinese. We were a company of Chinese that, sit, that was sent over. This is good, what they call SOE, Special Operation Executive. Altogether, we know of 150 men who were recruited just for what it was called Force 136, this kind of clandestine unit uh, that operated in Southeast Asia. So they sent us up to uh, Singar uh, Hills. I was in uh, India, New Delhi. That's what their headquarters is, Southeast Asia Command. Uh, it's a training camp there, like a special training. Uh, they were trainers mainly in uh, explosives and, and the demolition, uh, wireless and uh, unarmed compact and, and how to survive in the jungle. The jungle was uh, very, Thick. Once you're in the jungle, you're going to have a hard time finding your way out of the jungle. The direction, everywhere looked the same, you know. There were monkeys about the size of uh, three or four uh, uh, age. We were told not to irritate them because they could kill you. Oh, monkeys all over. <laughs> monkeys? Different kind. Snakes, different kind. In the pool of water, they, they got those, uh, the warm, that uh, blood sucker. That if you step on them, they tend to suck blood from you. Yeah, if the insects don't get you, and malaria will get you, and, and then if the enemy don't get you. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of things against you. I mean, this was dangerous. You know, work. You were being dropped behind enemy lines. You were working with, you know, locals to do things like blowing up, you know, train tracks, and it was guerrilla warfare. It wasn't really a suicide mission, but it was as close as you could get to it. You were really on your own. You didn't have the backing of an entire army or a battalion behind you with all sorts of reinforcement and communication. You basically had a wireless machine, uh, a couple of guns, grenades. And, uh, and really your wits. The, there was a high chance that even if they died, no one would ever know what happened to them. That if they were killed, you know, there, there was no ID. Uh, the Japanese, if, if they captured them, wouldn't even have reported. And you know, that the normal quote, rules of war don't apply to those who are seen to be, you know, um, spies. If they were caught, they would not have the same rights as, as a regular soldier and be taken as a POW they would be likely tortured and killed. We went down to the China coast to see how much Japanese strength was there. I saw piles of uh, corpses. It was frightening. The headless, headless and fingerless uh, corpses, all wearing British uniforms. 
And the cyanide pills are, the, you were to take them if you're captured, because uh, the enemy, enemy doesn't take prisoners, and they're pretty cruel. I was trained how to kill. You don't just go straight like that. You turn your knife, you ream it, you said, then to make sure, you know. And you sit back, uh, how did I got in a mess like this and call myself a hero? I go to sleep at night in the army. Couldn't sleep at night. Instead of laying with my pillow at my back, I used to get the pillow, put it on my face there, and cry. Uh, and then sit back and think how I'm going to get my other, my self out of this. So only being one thing, fight, fight, kill, or be killed. I was just a sign parachute jumping, but I didn't get to jump, because that was the last phase of the training. And uh, the Americans dropped the bomb, right? And uh, all of a sudden, everything came to a halt, training, everything, so. We sat there and waited, you know, a couple of days, see what the, what the Japanese would do. When they didn't, they dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki. The battleship Missouri, 53,000 ton flagship of Admiral Halsey's third fleet, becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony, marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. The war is over. Peace is here. My wish came to within a month I was back in, in civilian life. For many of the men who returned from combat, they were welcomed back, you know, by their families, by the, the Chinese Canadian community, and, you know, anyone who, who fought was welcomed uh, by a very appreciative, uh, you know, Canadian society. But as Chinese Canadians returned from the war, they had to go back to becoming second-class citizens. They, they had to accept that they had fought this war, the, a good war in everyone's estimation, um, and yet they were returning to places still built around white supremacy. And so for some of them, uh, they vocally began to argue, why, why can't we vote still? When we came back, we, we tried to get the uh, Canadian citizenship established. They talked about it, and they decided to send someone to Ottawa to talk to them about uh, equal rights and, and uh, equality and the right to vote and you know, things like that, right? And they came back, and uh, we got the vote in 1947. Chinese Canadians were finally granted full citizenship, the right to vote the right to live anywhere they wanted to, the right to swim in a public pool. Down in Chinatown celebrated because we were Canadians then. The Chinese were able to uh, uh, bring their families from over from China to Canada. So we, it was a, quite a jubilation. People moved out of Chinatown. People started getting, you know, having great careers, and everything changed. And uh, in 1957, Douglas Jung, who served in the very first group of Force 136, he goes on to become the first elected Chinese Canadian member of parliament, had a very illustrious career. And, and interestingly, it's just two generations ago, and you have a whole group of Chinese being raised now who have no idea that these things actually happened to their grandfathers. It took four decades after the war before the story of what they did you know, during the war came out. It's only now that many of them are older that they're willing to actually speak about uh, their experiences and they're no longer held to that secret. 
It's something that I just kept to myself, you know. Well, you don't go out and tell it, hey, hey, I did this, I did this. Well, we were happy. See? It's, it's a very human story. It's, it's a story of really brave individuals fighting not just battles overseas, but they, in fact, had a broader vision of fighting and struggling for a better country to return to. We often say the Chinese had a double victory. So the first victory was helping the Allies to win the war, and the second victory was to helping the Chinese community to finally be called Chinese Canadians.